welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about the importance of trees in urban forests with members of the executive team of the Texas Trees Foundation. Jeanette uh, Manier, President and CEO of the, Tech, uh, of the Texas Trees Foundation, and Ryan Larson, who is the Director of Development. So thank you both for joining us. It's, it's great, and thank you, attendees, for, for coming. Um, National Arbor Day is going to be celebrated at the end of the month. I know that Texas has a different uh, day, Jeanette. You told, told me it's in, it's in November, but today is Earth Day as well. So let's start this conversation by talking about the importance of trees, not only to our environment, but also to the mental and physical well-being of people living in urban areas like Dallas. Correct, and the trees are one of the most important uh, things that we have on this planet and one of the uh, longest organisms, living organisms there is. And I always say that there is a symbiotic relationship between trees and people. Uh, we need them and they need us. And I think they need us less than we need them. But um, if you look at the power of trees, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. The environmental, the economic, the physical, the social, and even the spiritual aspects of trees are really kind of what makes a quality of life in our cities. And what we're finding over the last few years in the research is that uh, trees directly uh, impact our health, our both physical and mental health and well being. And so if you start looking at what we call the biophilic effect, um, and that's our innate connection to nature and trees. Um, we're starting now to recognize nationally and globally the importance of trees in our lives as part of the infrastructure uh, of our communities. And, you know, we typically look at trees for oxygen and, and um, air quality, but it's so much more than that because our brains are actually, if you look at um, our brains, they are very connected to green and infrastructure. And if you want to talk you know, about fractals, those kinds of things, it's, it, we are wired to connect with nature. And um, Ulrich did some of the first studies back in the 80s about trees and looking out of a window uh, after uh, operations and uh, the reduction of post-operative complications. And I think that was really what set off the looking at uh, health and nature. And what we are doing with all of our programs now is wrapping all of our programming and projects around in uh, this health uh, uh, lens with trees and nature, especially one project in a medical district. Well, one of the things that, that, that I think is so interesting, and this is, this is one of the reasons we do what we do this show, right? If you look at how media treats um, issues of import, uh, politics, wars, crime, shootings, you know, those kinds of things, celebrities get a lot of attention. Then you look at trees and, and there's a little bit of, well, that's cute kind of, a, kind of an attitude. But then we start thinking, what happens if we took all the trees out of an urban environment? And there are urban areas in Dallas, in any urban area, where there are no trees, right? Those are not attractive places to live. That's not where people want to be. And very often the, the people who are there are impoverished and the services are not particularly good. And you, you sort of see that, that endemic divide between people who have and people who have not very often uh, along racial lines. So when you look at where we actually live, the places that we feel are the best places to live are places with greenery, right, Ryan? I mean, yeah. that's that's really part of what Jeanette was saying. So this is not a side issue. It really is a quality of human life issue in America. Yeah, and when we have done our research, we're able to go and see where tree canopy lacks and then also go and map that over with areas that have high minority populations or uh, high poverty. And so you do have some intersectionality between, okay, trees and also the societal issues that we're trying to deal with and trying to remedy. So it's, 
it's a good place to be in terms of our positioning because we can hit and provide um, multiple places for public good in the work that we do. Right, and it's the quality of life. It's that stressor within neighborhoods, right? It's the quality of life. It's it's the it's the trauma alleviation, right? That we're that we're all feeling because of COVID. That's part of it. It's 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 having a little bit of biodiversity in our city. So, Jeanette, let's talk a little bit about the actual programs that you have to um, ensure that we are repairing our urban environments and also preserving what we have. So, so if you could just sort of give us a sense of how the organization goes about its mission. So I, I came to Texas in 2007. And at that point in time, we really were not talking about climate change. Right. So I had to very quickly figure out how we were gonna move this organization forward. And that I figured out was doing studies and research. And so in 2015, we launched the State of the Dallas Urban Forest Report, which was three studies that from 2010 into 2015. And we launched that report with Mayor Rawlings. And that report really showed what percent of tree canopy we had. We had 28% tree canopy, 40% uh, 40, 40 is really a good, good tree canopy cover for cities. And we knew we had 1.8 million potential tree planting sites. But what that study showed was that we also had 35% impervious surface. So we did the next study, which was the urban heat island mitigation study. And that we could then look at at urban design and really start directing our efforts to those areas that had lower income, especially, um, but higher heat. So one of the things that we looked at is we looked at our, cool, our, our school campuses in Dallas and every school campus had less than 5% tree canopy. The average was around two to three. And so we knew that we needed to do something on our campuses at schools because that also added to kind of our, our carbon sinks, so to speak for this, the whole city of Dallas. So we started a program called Cool Schools, which develops outdoor environmental learning areas, right. which integrates um, and aligns with TEKS and um, is based in SMART. And so uh, that program has been very successful. We aligned that with the city of Dallas to expand the number of parks within a 10 minute walk in Dallas. And so that program is going very well and we've identified 40 schools to work with. The other, the other project that we worked at looked at is also our neighborhoods, neighborhoods projects. And the neighborhoods program really looks at a neighborhood scale. And there's a couple of things for this is it, yes, and we're looking at public, public lands mostly, um, but we're looking at how we can bring down the urban heat, but get the community involved in those projects more. Um, our biggest project is the Southwest Medical District. The medical district is the major uh, health district in the city of Dallas. Uh, it's a regional hospital district. It's, um, it's, a, it's about a thousand acres. But what we're doing there is we're actually redesigning the streetscapes of the whole district. And the project that we have now is a project which is on Harry Hines, which used to be one of the first major highways through the city of Dallas from downtown Dallas to Denton. And we're redesigning that, those streetscapes and that's uh, and taking out an intersection, an old cloverleaf intersection. Um, but what this project does really, Mark, is it really transcends us from tree planting to really strategically looking at where we're planting trees, why we're planting trees, and looking at the infrastructure and how we're planting trees. So the Southwest Medical District is about a $200 million project, and that's, that's an audacious uh, goal to do, but it's, we're, we've started that project, and we're really stitching together three hospital campuses to the public right-of-ways and creating this enormous green space in a 14-acre park right in the center of it. Um, and then we also look at, um, at our downtown areas and how do people 
traverse downtown from building to building or park to park or area to area in the shade. So it's really about mitigation of urban heat, quality of life, um, and all of these things that intersect. And, you know, you mentioned about low income neighborhoods. And one of the things that we see clearly is our public transportation corridors um, have really contributed to these neighborhoods being less healthy. And so if we can start looking at how we uh, redesign those streetscapes and bring down the um, CO2 and really make them feel safer and more connected. Um, I think that that is where we get to bringing down stress levels and, and, um, and things that affect human health at a biomarker level. The thing that I think that is so wonderful about, about this whole uh, narrative that you just laid out for us is that you don't have to be a woo-woo believer in, in some theoretical notion. We have, for example, determined that clover leaves are not particularly effective in terms of traffic management. Um, they create huge um, heat sinks um, and they don't actually manage traffic very well. You, we can deconstruct those. And, and uh, one of the things that I've been looking at, I've been playing with Google's uh, history map. Have you, have you seen these things where you can actually take a look at satellite images through time um, and you can actually go back. When you look at urban areas, what you see is that the most attractive neighborhoods, which uh, tend to map to areas that previously were forested and had a lot of trees, and had a lot of water in them and so on and so forth, they become areas where people live, they get paved over, the trees get cut down. And then as we get smarter, they become reforested, right? Which is essentially what you're doing. You're basically taking the mistakes of the past and you're adjusting them. And it's all about quality of life. It's all about their economic interests, right? Neighborhoods that are more attractive, that, that are less hot are going to be more valuable neighborhoods. It's, it's about uh, social equity, which, is, uh, which leads to less trauma and, and more peace. Ryan, when you ask somebody for an, an investor to invest in something that will bring them no return, no financial return, how do you pitch this? When you try and get people to come and help Jeanette raise that $250 million, <laughs> How do you, what is the value proposition for people in Dallas to invest in your programs? Well, I guess that's kind of where the pandemic, there's been a silver lining to that because um, people are, are feeling the impact and um, the benefits of getting outside and getting out in greenery, you know? And so, whereas you probably in the past felt, okay, yeah, trees are good. We, we always kind of start at that common, common ground. But now it's like, okay, um, they're not just good, but they're, they affect my spiritual well-being. They ex affect my mental health. So the value proposition is getting easier to share with uh, corporations and individuals because they now um, actually feel it at much more than they ever have before. Now, the question then is, is uh, how do I get somebody from, you know, generally... Uh, they, they Google, I want to plant a tree, okay? Uh, they land on Texas Trees Foundation because we got trees in our name. And how do I get behind them beyond just a uh, one-off tree planting? And I think that dives back to our research and what we're telling folks about and sharing folks and educating with folks about the benefits of trees and uh, how comprehensive they are. Um, not not just even you know personal well-being, but also like they reduce crime, um, they increase property values. There are so many things that we are able to go and then and then share. And so then what we'll, we'll, what our our job is to say, okay, here are the projects that we have identified and prioritized, and we are strategically going forward to move the needle. And then that's what they get excited about, and that's what they look at in terms of like investing for. Uh, the long term, so it's not just some, not just some one-off, and that's where you really want to get to. You're making a really interesting point. By the way, we just finished a poll in which we said uh, how important to quality of life of residents are urban forests and green spaces. 
92% said absolutely important and the rest said um, uh, very important. But you're making a really interesting point. Trees reduce crime. Trees attract employees, right? Trees help people feel better. Trees will reduce the impact of COVID. It's interesting to, 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 to make those connections because in that, if you have a lot of employees and you want to attract the best and the brightest, there is a reason to invest, isn't there, Jeanette? There is a reason to invest. And I, when, when I'm talking with donors, um, one of the things that they really like is the uh, research and the strategy. And the more strategic you are, um, the less controversial your work is as well, because the data backs up that work. But when you start looking at urban forestry around the country, um, there's no question that those cities that high, have higher um, canopy cover are much more healthy and much more, um, in, in some ways they draw a lot of new business. One of the things that's important, Mark, I think to remember is that especially in areas like Texas, um, when we're drawing new employees from areas like Chicago or Portland or Seattle, these cities that have trees, Minneapolis, um, it's not about just getting people here. It's about retaining people here. Right. And so when they start seeing that there's, you know, and the city of Dallas really has done an exceptional job, I think, over the last five years in terms of of uh, looking at mobility studies, looking at trails and looking at urban forestry. We're just completing a master plan, uh, urban forestry master plan for the city of Dallas. They've never had one. Um, but the other thing is that the work that we've done has really catalyzed the kind of work that the city is looking at. They now have their first comprehensive environmental plan and the State of the Dallas Urban Forest Report and the Urban Heat Island Study were instrumental in perpetuating the thinking in City Hall to get things uh, more aligned for a more sustainable and resilient city. I and a, I, I have a question about the research. You know, it annoys me to know when, when research really is, is simply a, a cover for already reached conclusions, right? You've seen this. You've seen this um, in business. You see it in nonprofits. You, you sort of start with the conclusion, then you shape research in order to deliver the conclusion that you've already reached. How do you make sure that your research has the credibility among skeptics who are really interested in facts, but are not interested in manipulations and push polls and those kinds of things? They really want to see that what you are doing actually addresses a question that needs answered. How do you how do you shape your research in that in that sense? We model. So we model what we're doing, and and sometimes you don't you aren't able to pull some of those folks in right away, but when they see the before and the after, mm -hmm. and they feel. Um, I was when not not too many years ago. I was walking with the mayor downtown, and it was really hot until we got to one certain area in the arts district. And Tom said, well, it's really cool here. And I said, that's because of the trees, you know? And so when you start looking at, at um, how trees affect temperatures in cities, and that gets again back to urban, the, the urban heat island effect, um, we're not just talking about air temperatures, we're talking about surface temperatures. And in the city of Dallas, a couple of years ago, we were out doing some surface temperatures and as a city of Dallas uh, campus, their, their uh, plaza there was over 147 degrees. Wow. So when you start kind of then looking at that and you start explaining um, that even the air intake into that building is overwhelmed by ho uh, hotter temperatures because of that, that's when you start kind of modeling. I think I think the biggest challenge to what you're talking about, Mark, is how do we educate over a plethora of different areas of, of research and of different um, 
aspects of the benefits of trees. And that's a bit harder, I think, to do in terms of, um, you know, we, we write position papers for the city of Dallas uh, decision makers, um, just because it's hard for everybody to understand and get into all of this with all of the others, like, like Ryan had mentioned, noise that's going on and issues that have to be addressed. So, so what you're saying is keep it commonsensical, make it com about common sense, make it about the human experience. Yes. The second thing you're saying, don't be overly complicated. We just, we just asked a uh, poll, what is the most important benefit the trees bring to urban spaces? We had all these different options, air pollution, soil erosion, noise pollution, actually, people focused on a few things, right? Improve physical and mental health, climate change uh, mitigation, provide uh, shade and heat reduction. And then there was a couple of answers related to uh, wildlife and plant diversity and, and beauty of, uh, of cities. But basically people focused on a few answers rather than a lot of other background noise that we inserted into the picture. They selected what was important to them. And I guess what you're saying is be, just reference everybody's experience, figure out what the facts are, provide the facts, and then interact with your audience in a way that drives forward your programs, right, Ryan? Yeah, and if I could just add one more uh, item, and that's why the Southwestern Medical District project is so important, because we're going to have a before and after, and it's not just about a putting in a park and, and doing a streetscape and planting a bunch of trees. We will be able to conduct longitudinal studies over the time and then be able to go and share what does this area look like? What happens when we actually design for people? Um, what happens to the neighborhoods and to the mental health and the actual, as, as Jeanette said, biophilic um, metrics to people as they interact with green spaces? And we're gonna we will we will have the actual data, and it's gonna be um, it's gonna be compelling. And um, we think that for leaders within city government, it's kind of nice for city of Dallas to say, yeah, we're paving the way here on uh, green spaces and the importance importance of them. We're the model for the rest of the country and elsewhere. So if I'm if I'm a Dallas-based uh, banker with a really strong relationship with uh, my friends over in Houston who are in the oil industry. And I don't believe in climate change at all. Your pitch is your pitch. You still can talk with me. You can still talk about these projects. And, and I can still, regardless as to whether I buy the, the issues of climate change and so on and so forth, I can still feel the heat, right? Because I'm still walking on the street with you, Jeanette. Right, I can still think about the fact that those neighborhoods are more valuable when they have uh, uh, tree coverage and foliage and so on. Uh, people seem to be happier. You can still pitch me, right, uh, uh, Ryan? Exactly. Yeah, we can still pitch, but also your employees are gonna pitch you too, because your employees are gonna be coming into that organization and saying, okay, what are we doing about, what are we doing about climate? What are we doing about urban heat? What are we, what are we doing? I want to have a livable place for my kids. And so um, uh, these, we're seeing more and more companies with green teams and generally they are uh, filled with uh, younger folks that are participating in, the, in those. Um, we're, we're leveraging that. Um, and fortunately, many of the, the leadership of these companies are seeing um, and um, react and acting on uh, the push from their employees, which is which is a good thing. And then uh, Governor Abbott and and uh, and uh, the government of Texas also is trying to be responsible to its citizens. So again, you finesse this whole unproductive debate, right, Jeanette? Of of you know of of whether people believe or don't believe, they can just feel, right? They can they can feel what they experience every day. And be responsive to their constituents, and and then you you end up having allies instead of having these these silly debates, right? Right, and you know Governor Abbott is very involved in our Southwest Medical District, as is Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson and and Representative Colin Allred. So you know I think that when you start looking at the work that you're doing, you also have to really start looking at what is the advocacy framework you're working in. Because, you know, for Governor Abbott, he's really looking at how this, 
how the work that we're doing in the Southwest Medical District can uh, promote economic development. Uh, Representative Johnson is a former nurse and she's looking at the health and wellness as well as kind of the equity issues in the area. So you made a really good point, Mark, in terms of how you bring it to each individual, whether um, they, uh, they, and how they bring, how then they can take it to their constituents. And um, so it's, it's getting back, it's kind of that symbiotic relationship between trees and people and how it actually affects them and the things they like to do. You know, people that love to go trout fishing, if the waters are too hot, there is no trout to fish. No trout. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so, frankly, if the, wa if the waters are just right, I can't catch a trout to save my life. So <laughs> I, I, I have to confess, have tried. Trout don't like me. <laughs> Either that or I'm a completely unskilled fisherman, that might be a possibility as well. So we work in urban areas, but if you're looking at things like watershed management, when you're looking at transportation corridors, when you're looking, it's all interconnected and, and it's kind of the ecosystem and rebalancing that ecosystem in cities through trees and green infrastructure. Well, there's so much that, that binds the nation together and you can go to any urban environment any place in the United States, and you have these same issues. And there's a lot that you do that can inform others. We just completed a, a, another poll, really interesting results. Uh, would you consider moving to a neighborhood without parks, trees, and other green spaces? And fully 58% said, I would never move to a place without green spaces in the neighborhood. And then um, there were 8% there were that said if the cost of living was 20% cheaper, I would move. And there were a few people, you know, it had to be 30% cheaper. And 25% said, yes, okay, I might do it if it was 25% uh, less expensive um, uh, to move there. Um, I'm sorry, 40% less expensive to move there. So the, it, what's interesting is that we tried to create a pricing structure for giving up trees and we got some people said never and we had the rest of them fully 25 percent said well yes but it would but my cost of living would have to be 40 percent less which just shows the value that people place i think you can find this across the united states um let's uh close up we're coming to the end of our time so let's close uh up with um lessons that you each feel could be shared with other uh, urban environments across America. Ryan, could you uh, talk a little bit from the fundraising perspective? And then we're going to wind up with you, Jeanette. But from the from the fundraising and investor perspective, investing in the United States and in changing the landscape in urban areas, what do you think is the most important lesson that you can provide to different urban environments across America? I think you have to show those corporations the actual proof of impact and the tangible benefit. And um, fortunately, when their employees participate in our projects, uh, they um, can see the actual um, benefit that they just, they can see that planted tree. And not just that, then they drive by and they they monitor it and they care about it. And then they tell me, boy, that tree is looking really, really good. And so um, for those investors, they are able to go and see their investment in the community. And so um, that they are work, that they work, that their employees, you know, work and play in. And so uh, our job is to actually share that and communicate our research, communicate our projects in a very, very real way, and then let that conversation breathe and generally we get the positive result we're looking for. So what you're saying is if you don't want to have a transient economy that disappears, you have to have a sustainable neighborhood that people enjoy working in, being in, living in, raising their families in, right? Correct. And I will even go back to what you said in terms of like you put that monetary a uh, dollar figure on going to a lower cost living place. Okay, so I moved down here from to Dallas from Seattle, so a very forested place. It's a less cost of living, but when you get here, 
you may come here for that lower cost of living, but then you're going to want to affect the change and look to go and get more greenery. And that's what's happening. So their employees are going to drive it as well. Interesting. Very interesting. Jeanette, I will give you the last word. What do you think we can teach the entire nation uh, about uh, from, from the work that you're doing at the Texas Trees Foundation? Well, trees are kind of a, they're for everybody, right? And so I, I, I would ask and, and say that connect with trees, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, uh, no matter what level in an organization you are. Um, I think creating that awareness and that, um, that relationship with our natural environment, um, you will automatically then want to advocate and promote and take action to support urban forestry and trees. And I would point to what you had said previously, Jeanette, it's the use of facts, right? The whole idea of uh, we should have principles, but the principles also need to be supported by facts on how those principles affect human beings' uh, daily lives. I think that your collection of data, your sharing of data, you're trying to ensure that that data maps to human experience so that it's very easy to connect uh, with. It's not overly uh, complicated and inaccessible. I think that's a really important point because that with data, we can actually decide what our strategies are to make uh, our lives better. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you both, Jeanette Monier, President and CEO of the Texas Trees Foundation, and Ryan Larson, Director of Development. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Attendees, thank you for attending. Thanks for your participation on the, uh, on the uh, questions and the Q&A uh, uh, functions. We'll see you on next Tuesday, where we'll be talking about the foster care system. And everybody, mask up. Stay safe. We're almost to the finish line. Let's, let's uh, stay healthy. <laughs>